Okay. 19, take two. Take it a little further back, Michael. Take it from uh, the solemn temples, the great globe. 21, take one. Action. Okay. 45, take one. Okay. 14, take four. We are holding on the fire. Have been. Action. The red sunset lay on the curved horizon of the prairie. The air was still and cold, and in it settled the mute darkness and greater cold of night. High in the air there was wind. A sensation of torment, of two-sided, unpredictable nature rose from the stillness of the earth. That was the opening paragraph of Walter Van Tilburg Clark's short story, The Portable Phonograph. The words are the work of a first-rate writer. The image we saw on the screen was certainly adequate, but the combination of the two simply did not come off. The fact is, of course, that the words as such are superfluous in the film context, not that they don't work in the short story. Clark is a master at creating mood and atmosphere and setting. Let's try another opening. You do look, my son, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir. Our revels now are ended. These, our actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits and are melted into air. Now, what the camera was up to in that sequence was not only to recreate the experience which Clark gives us as we read his opening paragraph, but to do so as faithfully as possible. Not all film writers, of course, consider it necessary or even desirable to be faithful to the original author. Many novels and short stories and plays, when translated to the screen, bear precious little resemblance to their originals. You may have heard the story about the Hollywood film producer who telephoned a friend and said enthusiastically, I've just bought a great book, but I think I've got it licked. A funny story, but it illustrates at least one important fact. Many novels and plays and short stories simply do not translate easily to the film. But what does it mean to be faithful to the original? Can there be no dialogue, no incident, no characters that are not in the original? Or is telling a story on paper one thing, on film another? I met a man once, shortly after it happened. He was bearing on his back a large suitcase, leather bound, so heavy he could scarcely totter a few pitiful steps before he had to rest. It was stuffed with banknotes. <laughs> Money. <laughs> Thousands, millions, who knows? It was impossible to convince him that it was worthless. You will not find that dialogue in Clark's original. The question is, would his characters have spoken those words? And if so, do they contribute to the theme and development of the story? Clark was a writer keenly aware of his role in the traditions of Western civilization. If a nuclear war comes, Clark asks, if civilization goes down, what do we believe worth saving? Clark, through his main character, Dr. Jenkins, tells us what he would save, and in doing so has written a fine short story, one that critics agree will stand comparison with the better stories of contemporary fiction. Why then, you might well ask, make a movie of it? In Clark's story, his main character has been reading from Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. We have heard Michael Gwynn, one of England's great actors, reading Shakespeare's tremendous verse. And it's also spoken by William Squire, a leading player of Britain's National Theatre. Our rebels now are ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, were all spirits that are melted into air, into thin air, and like the baseless fabric of this vision, the cloud-capped towers, the gorgeous palaces, uh, solemn the solemn temples, the great globe itself, 
Yea, all which it inherit shall dissolve, and like this insubstantial pageant faded, leave not a rack behind. In the story, Clark writes of music, of the titles, and the tremendous dead names of the composers, and the artists, and the orchestras. Few novelists write so evocatively about music as Clark, but in a film, we can have the music itself, played by Walter Gieseking, perhaps the greatest of all interpreters of Claude Debussy's piano works. Now, does all this demonstrate that the film medium is better than the printed word, or simply that it is different? Clark, as I said, writes brilliantly about music. The wet blue-green notes tinkled forth from the old phonograph and were individual delectable presences in the cell, a sudden tide of unbearably beautiful dissonance. If Debussy's music can be characterized by words alone, Clark has done it. But once again, in a film, we have no need for words. We can have the music itself. On the other hand, what do we look at as we listen? Clark himself supplies the answer. In all the men, except the musician, he writes, there occurred sequences of tragically heightened recollection. The music, that is, calls forth memories in the minds of the men, and memory can be dramatically realized through the film technique of the flashback. Thus, we see the harsh man, when he was not harsh and bitter, but gentle and hopeful. Debussy's hauntingly beautiful music and another flashback reveal the book lover in happier times. Shakespeare, the Bible, Moby Dick, the Divine Comedy. You might have done worse. Much worse. And last, the music evokes a younger Dr. Jenkins, the eternal amateur of art. Amateur, in this context, meaning a lover of art. But what about the musician? Perhaps he himself, before the devastating atomic war, played Debussy's Nocturne. Why not then flash back to show him at the piano? A sequence like this can, of course, be reasonably effective. But would it be right in a film of the portable phonograph? Again, Clark, the original author, gives us an unmistakable clue in his story as to what would be right. In all the men except the musician, he writes, there occurred sequences of tragically heightened recollection. He heard nothing but what was there. Walter Clark was, as I said before, keenly aware of the importance of our literary and artistic traditions. And in the portable phonograph, he asks, or rather insists, that we decide where we stand. What do we think is really important in our civilization? I wonder, if I had had the chance to save something, just a few things, what would they have been? 10, thank you, Ray. Good night, Doctor, and thank you very much. Good night. Thanks. Come again in a week. We shall have the Gershwin. 